Hello, everyone, and welcome. Looks like we've got a fair number of folks still joining and connecting by audio. So we're going to give everyone just a couple more minutes to join us. Hi, Jan. Great to see you. See, we've got folks from our program sites here. We have teachers here. We have this year's Master Teacher Fellows here. So it's just a fantastic mix. It's always so nice to welcome everyone and see um, everyone who's interested in participating in this roundtable series. So welcome. See, we also have a couple of repeat joiners. So folks who have been interested in this topic for a while are joining us for, for our second installment in this area. Great, welcome everyone. Um, while we're waiting, I'm just gonna make sure everybody can see that down at the bottom of your screen, you should see that there is a chat box. So please use that chat box to say hello and introduce yourself. If you're from a program site, go ahead and let us know that. If you're a teacher, let us know that, let us know where you're from. Um, so introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, throughout the course of this roundtable, if you have any questions at all, we are saving a good chunk of time at the end of the roundtable for some Q&A from all of you. So please make sure you're putting your questions in there and we will collect them and make sure we get those questions answered as we go. So welcome everyone. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, so thanks for getting the ball uh, rolling, Jan, by introducing yourself. Please everyone else just say hi in the chat. Tell us where you're from. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to say hello to everyone. And thank you all for coming to our sixth installment of the Amgen Biotech Experience Teacher Roundtable Series. I'm Jessica Juliuson. I'm the Director of Professional Development and Networking for ABE. And a little bit of background, these, ses these roundtable sessions were originally designed specifically for our ABE Master Teacher Fellows. And this year, we really wanted to open them up to our incredible ABE teacher community from around the world as a chance for all of our teachers to learn from experts and from each other about topics of special interest to science and biotechnology teachers. So we really hope you find this series valuable. We encourage you to please tag us in social media if you want to share your thoughts. And so you can use the tag at ABE Prog Office. And maybe Amy can help us out by pasting that in the chat. So um, I'm never very good at pronouncing these handles um, from Twitter. Um, I also wanted to let everyone know that this roundtable will be recorded and posted on our website. And that if you are registered for today's roundtable, you will receive a transcript of the discussion and a copy of any materials shared today. So we will have time for audience questions at the end. Please put your questions in the chat box at any point, and we will be sure to watch for those and to ask your questions at the end. So first, I just need to say that I am personally so pleased and honored to be welcoming back two of our wonderful ABE Master Teacher Fellows. Uh, they're representing our ABE San Francisco and ABE Rhode Island teacher communities. Our panelists today were part of the very first cohort of fellows in 2020-21. And in their time with us, they brought us some of their classroom and content expertise and wove it into two incredibly timely and useful curriculum projects, which they'll be talking to you about today. And today they will share with you why culturally sustaining approaches are important in science classrooms, strategies that they have used to make teaching precision medicine more inclusive, more responsive, and more celebratory of cultural difference, and some examples of specific activities from their own classrooms. So without taking up any more time, let me introduce our distinguished roundtable panelists. Tracy Saros joins us from ABE San Francisco, and Tracy is a life sciences teacher at Gilroy High School in Gilroy, California. She has a background in molecular biology and has been teaching ABE labs in her biotechnology classes since 2014. Tracy's a veteran teacher within the ABE community and was one of the first teachers to pilot the ABE precision medicine curriculum and to help us make it much, much better than it was the first time she laid eyes on it. Um, her 2020 Master Teacher Fellowship project focused on race and the variations in human DNA, and she'll be sharing more of that project with us later today. Dr. David Upegi, or just Upegi, as he is known to his students, joins us from ABE Rhode Island. Dr. Upegi describes himself as a Latino immigrant who found his way out of poverty through science, and he currently serves as a science teacher at his alma mater, Central Falls High School in Rhode Island, and is an adjunct professor of education. 
Upegi's personal philosophy and inclusive approach to science education have enabled students to become problem solvers and innovative thinkers. He started and still runs his school's science Olympiad team and has contributed to publications on science education and pedagogy. His 2020 Master Teacher Fellowship project was on race as a social construct. So I just wanna thank you both so much for being with us today. We really appreciate your time. We know how busy it is when you're actually still teaching, which both David and Tracy still do. Um, so we're gonna begin. I'd like to ask each of you to tell us just a little more about your role and the students that you teach. So how do you think of or define culturally sustaining pedagogy? And why do you think it's important in science classrooms? Maybe we can start with you, Tracy. Sure. Um, so I teach in Gilroy, California. I teach high school life sciences. Um, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area, about half an hour south of San Jose. Um, demographically, our student population is primarily Hispanic, almost 80% of our students. Um, and we have a, a, a lot of low income families. So about 64% of our students are considered socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, our school offers a unique program called the Biomedical Science Academy. That's a four year commitment where students take eight, eight science classes while they're in high school. Um, and so I teach the first two uh, classes in that series, which are biomedical science and biotechnology. Um, and I've been teaching ABE labs for many years and in my biotech classes. And as Jessica mentioned, I also piloted the precision medicine unit a couple of years ago. Um, so my students in biotech are primarily our bi uh, biomedical science academy students, um, but we also, we also offer it as an elective, so anybody can take it that's interested. Um, and then in, in addition to those classes, I also teach freshman biology, which is the class I designed my project for. Um, to me, culturally sustaining pedagogy means bridging the gaps between students' identities and their life experience and what they're learning in class. Um, I think it's important because may, many of my students, if not most of them, kind of use science as a technical, complex thing that they can't relate to, they don't understand, and it's not something that they see as accessible to them as a career, um, even though we have so many different opportunities in our area. Uh, So yeah, science is definitely one of those subjects that students think they're either good or bad at. So I think it's really important to be able to relate to their own experience and just sort of bring it into the, you know, their own world and how they view things. Um, also, I think it's important to give agency and ownership um, to, to, to engage students more um, in the content and to be able to see themselves you know, more in the role of science. Thank you so much, Tracy. I know that's um, the whole idea about science as a way to prepare yourself and to be future ready for your students and that it can actually help shape their own identity is something I know has resonated with you, David. And I wonder if I could pose the same question to you, um, a little more about your role and the students that you teach and why you think culturally sustaining pedagogy matters. Thank you so much. I want to just begin by thanking everybody for being here or for listening if you're not currently uh, on this call, uh, because I know that this has been a difficult year for all of us. And uh, the fact that you're taking the time to reflect on these ideas already shows us that, that you're working towards improving the world. So thank you for taking that time and for allowing me to speak. And Jess, I think that one of the things that's really important to me is that science education can be a conduit for both individual empowerment, right? What it did for me was it took me out of poverty and, and it can do that for other students, but it also is about the empowerment that it brings to a community. So I always begin my, my AP biology class. Um, so let me give you a little background first. Um, I teach at my alma mater. It is the smallest school. Uh, it's the smallest city in the smallest state. So I teach in Central Falls, Rhode Island. It is a community that is predominantly racially minoritized and all 100% poor. So we're 100% free and reduced lunch, um, and about 85% racially minoritized people. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there's no greatness in there. Of course there is, right? I always tell my kids, 
look, the universe is not stingy with greatness. It's spread it everywhere. And it, therefore, it's our responsibility to, to ensure that that, that that greatness is built, that it's nurtured appropriately. And so with that, I begin my AP Bio class every year by standing in front of my kids and telling them, there is nothing I can do or say to make you great because you're already great. My job is to just provide the mirror that shows you your greatness. And that mirror comes in the way of academic challenges, right? To provide the opportunities because Superman isn't super simply because he's got superpowers or Wonder Woman is not wonderful simply because she's got superpowers. It's the fact that they're facing these amazing enemies, right? In the case of Superman or Wonder Woman, I don't know what it is, but the idea is that it's not just, you know, we're great because we have powers. It's because we have the challenges that allow us to see what our own powers are. And that's really what I try to provide. And one of the things that I, I like to just wrap this up with is the idea that our very future as a species depends on the students that are sitting in front of us right now. Sadly, these students are going to inherit an earth that is hotter, that is overpopulated, that is full of economic and political turmoil. And so if we're not preparing these students to address and fix the problems that they're inheriting, we're, we're damning all of society, all of, all, all of our species. And therefore, uh, one of the things that a friend of mine, Dr. Kirsten Milks always says is the tools of science are also the tools of liberation. So when we teach these kids and if we use the NGSS language, how to ask questions and how to analyze data, how to engage in argument based on evidence, when we teach these children how to do those things using science, we're also empowering them to be more powerful citizens and people that are gonna go out into the world and improve it for all of us. And so that's my setting and that's sort of my connection to culturally relevant uh, science education. Thank you so much, David. And I think if, if we hear nothing else from both of you, we're hearing this <clears throat> sense of urgency and the fact that this is something that is really an imperative for science teachers to be grappling with and thinking about how are they um, reflecting that kind of mindset and lens for their students. Um, so the next question I have for you is really about that. Um, precision medicine is, it's not necessarily um, been around for, for a long time, but certainly it, it has been out there. Um, so thinking about how you teach that, what aspects of precision medicine do you think need new approaches or strategies in science classrooms and why? And, and perhaps even more importantly, how did your own thinking change about how students should explore precision medicine? And maybe start with you again this time, David, and then we'll come to you, Tracy, after. Sure. I think one of the, the most important components of teaching biology or, or life sciences to our students right now is understanding that we're living in an amazing time. I, I always tell my students we're living, um, and I'm a little biased, but I believe that we're in the greatest country in the world at the greatest time in history, where for the first time ever, we have knowledge and understanding of genetics, of molecular biology, of cellular biology that just wasn't existent before. So now we have access to these things. And I can assure you that our my grandmother, even as far as, you know, 30, uh, you know, 80 years ago, she was not learning about these things. And here we have an opportunity to teach these things. But even in that time span, since I was in high school, it's sad to say it's almost 30 years ago, but even in those 30 years, things have changed. And one of the things that I think is most important for us to focus when we think about precision medicine is to understand that individual differences, number one, are the driving force of evolution, right? So when we look at differences, that is a fundamental component of how evolution works. If we were all the same, it would be horrible. And so um, one of the conclusions that I hope my students always uh, garnered when they go through my classes is to realize that Hitler wasn't just wrong morally, he was biologically wrong. Right? If we are homogeneic, we're actually de damning ourselves as a, as, a, as a species. So diversity is beautiful and it's important and it's valuable biologically speaking. The other thing is that this way of grouping humans, the way that we were grouped in the past, and starting with uh, Carolo Linnaeus in his 10th edition, I think one of the things that's really important is that when Linnaeus grouped humans, he grouped them in a way that was beneficial to some while making sure that others could be easily oppressed. And that's one thing about precision medicine that's beautiful because it explores the diversity of humans. And when we start looking at the diversity, we come to fully recognize that humans cannot be uh, grouped in the ways that uh, we have been taught. And, and part of that liberation that comes from understanding this is that there's so much overlapping 
both genetically and culturally and, and the fact that we're human. And to me, one of the things that's really valuable is comparing, for example, chimpanzees living in the same area. So um, you look at chimpanzees that live in the Republic of Congo, Zaire, uh, and, and you see that their that genetic diversity is greater than humans who lived in different continents. We are truly 99.9% .9 the same genetically. We are one single species. And anything that attempts to separate us and subjugate one group of people versus another is, is a social construct that we need to eliminate. So I use precision medicine and the idea of the, the knowledge that's come from the Human Genome Project to illuminate the fact that we're certainly much more alike than we're different. And when we focus on exterior and superficial differences such as skin, skin pigmentation patterns, we are robbing ourselves from enjoying our humanness, our, our connectedness. And like I tell my students, look, if there's a rat in your house, you don't stop and go, wait, hold on, it's a gray rat. No, it's a rat, right? Like you don't want rats in your house in the same way. And I jokingly tell my kids, you know, when we get, uh, when the aliens come, we're all equally in, in trouble, right? <laughs> because when they look at us, they're not gonna look at uh, one person and say, well, they have more pigmentation than another. We're so much alike. They're gonna say two, four facing eyes, 32 teeth, two canine, three inner ear bones. I mean, everything that makes us human is shared among everybody, regardless of the continent they're in. I love that you have both the um, inspiring uh, example of what kids can do for our planet and then the aliens are gonna get us anyway in the end. So, so thank you for that tension there, David. <laughs> So Tracy, for you, um, same question. So how about um, as you think about teaching precision medicine, and you were part of really kind of shaping the ABE curriculum for this, um, what do you think is so important to change about how it has been taught um, in the past and, and sort of how has your thinking evolved over time as you've approached it in the classroom with your students? So my primary experience with teaching precision medicine was that um, ABE unit that we piloted two years ago. Um, and I think really what stands out to me and what, um, what made it really engaging and made me sort of think of different ways that I could maybe structure other parts of my class, uh, it, it, it had these kind of personal aspects. The science was very intense and it, it was at times very hard for students to digest, especially the bioinformatics stuff. It was just kind of, you know, when I trained on it, I didn't understand it the first time. It took me quite a while to really sort of wrap my head around it. And so there was a lot of st like stuff flying at them, but what made it engaging and what sort of hooked them was the, you know, the case studies that they could really relate to seeing these, these different, you know, people of different ages and different ethnic groups reacting to medicines in different ways, you know, with the same disease or um, the, the aspect of, you know, dealing with their own DNA, sequencing their own genes and analyzing their own data made it really personal. So I think that that, that made it really sort of a, a very engaging and relatable thing for students to be able to personalize it, you know, and to be able to uh, sort of invest themselves in it. And that made it worth the pain of having to figure out, you know, what are we looking at with the DNA sequences, you know? So I, I found it really engaging. It really brought everything to life. And it really, uh, it made it sort of personal and real for the students. I love hearing you describe that. And um, thank you for your, your sort of transparency and honesty in talking about what that can feel like as a teacher, as you're trying to venture into the waters of teaching this content. And so my next question is really about that, which is, um, you know, we have a lot of science teachers in our ABE community and outside the ABE community who may want to go there and may want to engage in this content, but um, maybe are not sure where to start. So I'm wondering if you can share whether there are any specific resources of, as you've approached both precision medicine and culturally sustaining pedagogy. Um, what have you, where have you gone? Where have you looked to help inform your curriculum to help it be more culturally responsive? Um, what are some resources you would go to and what advice would you have for other teachers who may be unsure how to go about it? Tracy, let's start with you again this time and then we'll go to David. All right, so I sort of jumped into the, this was, it was a scary place to go for me. And so I would say, you know, for me, feeling like sort of unprepared and untrained and what am I doing? 
And the most important thing was to just to be brave and to try things, you know, and to jump in. Um, but something that I found that's been really valuable for me is anything that engages student voice or student choice or like getting feedback from students. I do a lot of Google surveys with my students, like, you know, every week that we're, that I'm able to get feedback from them on things that they're struggling with or things that they're interested in. Um, and I think that that's something that can really, you know, hook and engage the students and make the learning more uh, personal for them. Um, I've also, I've been using a tool in my classroom this year that we uh, used over the pandemic that I never thought would be useful live, which is Pear Deck, which is, you know, interactive slides where students are typing. Um, but I've, I've realized that it helps elicit a lot more student voice than having a conversation where somebody might not feel comfortable saying something out loud, where you might hear from three or four students, but in this context, I'm able to get feedback from everybody, you know, so that's been a tool that I've been surprisingly still using. Um, Lab Exchange has been really valuable. It has a lot of, uh, for instance, something I used in my project, uh, scientist videos about different careers, you know, different people. And so students are able to see things that they're personally interested in, perhaps, or somebody that looks like them. Um, and also the interactives that allow them to, you know, get the experience of doing the hands-on labs virtually. Um, but again, as my advice, at least from my perspective, is really just to be brave and jump in and try things. There are a lot of resources out there. There are a lot of um, things that are already built that you know you can adapt to your situation. Um, but I think the experience of doing it, it really gives you a more nuanced kind of feel for um, how students react and what they need, and you know, it gives you a like a a basis for building on and for, you know, going deeper in other avenues. I love that. And I, I always appreciate how you kind of remind us all that when you're uh, the really great teachers are also always learning and continuing to go out and seek those kinds of resources to help inform what they do. Um, David, how about for you? You've talked, I know you shared so much about some wonderful people and resources that you went to as you've kind of been informing your journey in this area. Yeah, so I want to build on what Tracy was saying because I, 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 it really resonates with me. The idea that as teachers, we continue to ask questions, to learn, to explore, really, to, and to speak with others when we have these sort of doubts and when we're trying to grow. And, and the fact that anybody is here or listening to this right now, it already shows. I mean, this is a sign that you're interested in learning more. So that's, that's wonderful. I did find some allies out there. Um, I mean, one thing you could do is you can go ahead and finish a, a, a PhD. Uh, it only takes like six and a half years and uh, <laughs> a lot of frustration, <laughs> but that, that is the way that, that I actually came across a lot of this literature. So it was great. And I want to suggest two people, particularly um, because they were, they were really meaningful when I sort of discovered them. I mean, originally it was uh, Richard Lewontin who wrote in, in 91, a, a wonderful little book. It's, it's really thin, it's called Biology as Ideology. And that sort of led to a whole new sort of section in the library. Uh, and now in today's world, uh, unfortunately, Wanton has passed away, but there are two very significant writers who write beautifully about these kind of topics. One of them is Dr. Joseph Graves Jr. Uh, and the other one is Dr. Agustin Fuentes. So I'm going to share in the chat. Uh, the first one I'm going to share here is Agustin Fuentes, who, who was part of the, the group of people who wrote the statement on race and racism for the American Association of Biological Anthropologists. And the other one is uh, Dr. Joseph Graves Jr.'s uh, latest book, or the one that, that came out last year. It's called Racism Not Race, Answers to Frequently Asked Questions. Oh, I think David, are you frozen? He might have frozen while he is um, telling us about Joe Graves. And I, while he is um, unfreezing, um, I just want to share that uh, Joe Graves is actually going to be part of a new site that um, 
that, and so he's been working with our program office team and we're really excited to share some of his resources. So we'll make sure for anyone who registered um, for this particular round table, we'll share out those resources. Uh, David, you just froze briefly. So we just, um, while you were talking about Joseph Graves's book, so I'll pitch it back to you. Thank you. So uh, am I good now? Okay, perfect. So um, he was incredibly uh, generous. He, he actually let me read an earlier version of his book before it was published. And the, the work here is significant because these are scientists who are exploring these concepts, both as a social construct and, and what the implications are on a biological system, such as uh, the human species. And so these two have been amazing resources for me. Um, but I think that the more we explore, the more that we connect things for our students, the more that they see opportunities to, to really question the very basis of social constructs. I think that's one way that we can ensure that they are preparing for a future that uh, is going to be tough. And I just want to tie one thing, you know, I, I sort of jokingly talked about the aliens thing, right? And, and there's a reason for it. I, I just want to tell you sort of the bigger picture. Uh, one of the things I do with my students is I have them write an essay, actually it's five uh, constructive responses to an alien, uh, and they're describing life on Earth. So this is part of a project that they do for my AP biology class, in which what they're doing is they're talking about the biochemistry of life. So they have to describe sort of the chemistry of life, but instead of just asking them to describe the biochemistry of life, I say, you know, here's an alien, they just abducted you, and your job is to explain to them how life on Earth is carbon-based and sort of the major macromolecules. And then, then they explore the phylogeny of humans and who are we related to and homology and analogy. Uh, and then they have to create an ecosystem that they explore as they're traveling and they find a predator and, a, you know, and sort of primary consumers and secondary consumers and producers. And they have to describe all these things. So in this project, they're, they're, they're diving deep into biology, but because it's, they're, they're, so, they're telling a story to an alien, they sort of forget. And they're doing all this research to try to convince this alien about what life is like on the earth. And so that's why I bring up the alien thing. It's not really that I think we're going to get abducted. I don't know. <laughs> I just, but I do remind them quite often that, you know, for any outsider that comes into earth, humans are humans. We are no different than when we look at different pigmented rats. We don't think like, well, that's a rat that's gray versus that one is white versus that one is black. They're a rat. And in that sense, rat is rat is right. Humans, homo sapiens, homo sapiens. That's who we are, right? We're, we're the same kind of thing. So I just wanted to connect that for you. I love it, David. Thank you for clearing that up. And that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, and I just wanted to, to note that, that we've mentioned a few resources and a few people um, that have been shared in the chat. So we'll make sure if you are just listening and not able to view the chat, we'll make sure that we get those into um, the transcript as well when we share this with you after the round table so that you can be sure to find them. Um, and uh, so one just kind of very Last question is, we do have somebody who has asked, besides ABE, are there any other kinds of classroom resources that you have found particularly useful um, to help with a biotechnology class and to help particularly infuse diversity, equity, and inclusion into those classes? And I know you've both been part of creating resources for that. Um, but were there any others that you've kind of, that you know that you've went to a lot as you were writing or developing this curriculum or just trying to infuse DEI into your biotech classes? Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. I, I can jump in for a second. Uh, I love what, what Jan just put up about uh, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. There are so many places within the biological or life science curriculum where we can introduce these ideas. So whenever you're teaching about cells, it, it is the right time to talk about Henrietta Lacks and how her cells were taken without consent from her or her family. Similarly, you can do that when you talk about DNA and the DNA structure, that is a time to speak about Rosalind Franklin and describe what happened. When you talk about, um, you know, anytime that you can bring up stories about people that have been neglected or oppressed, I mean, I, one of the things I've done is I developed a whole storyline about racist scientists. So we look at someone like Marion Sims, who is the modern father, the, the father of modern gynecology. And yet we know now that the reason why he got so good at it is because he was doing experimental surgeries on enslaved women without their consent and even worse without anesthesia, because he was under the impression that black women did not feel pain, that at least not the same when they white women did. And 
you know, the, the, it, it's full of these kinds of people. You know, you can look at that history. Uh, I can think of Samuel Morton, who was a craniologist, uh, phrenologist who, who was trying to convince people that black people were inferior. And so he goes out and measures skull sizes and then comes up with some crazy, you know, half cooked theory. But then he's a horrible scientist because what we know about sizes of head is that they're directly related to the sizes of the body. People that are bigger have bigger heads. And so in his sample, he just gets these gigantic men of, of European descent. And he says, look, they have bigger brains. But if he had ever measured like a Shaquille O'Neal head, his whole data would have been thrown off, right? Shaquille O'Neal is a huge human being with a huge head. And so uh, the, the story of, of scientific racism is, is sprinkled with these, not only a moral people, but um, with just bad science. And I think it's a great place whenever, anytime you get a chance to describe how science actually works. And, and science at this very heart, at its foundation is about falsification. And so when these people uh, rely on what they, or they're calling science, and then you start exploring, you realize that they're just really full of nonsense. I love kind of what you've been saying about the emphasis on story as well as being, um, I, the question sort of came from the place of where do I find these resources and the stuff that I can use in my classroom? And I think what you're talking about is the fact that stories can be such a rich resource for science classrooms. And that oftentimes we haven't necessarily gone there because science is bench science or lab skills or things like that, but that stories can really infuse that context of the curriculum. And so seeking out those personal stories um, and, and not from a deficit perspective either, but the, the people who have contributed to the field. Um, well, so I'd love to hear, right? yeah. You, and you, I, you I, I, in science and realizing yeah. that science is a human endeavor. So telling the story of, of Meischer when he first found out DNA from pus, how interesting is that? Or Hershey and Chase. I mean, these are beautiful experiments that have been done that have led to our current understanding. It wasn't just magically done. I mean, this is hours of, you know, on top of hours of research of human time and, and creativity and thoughtfulness. And so, you know, whether it's, uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Lynn Margulis and endosymbiosis, or whether it's uh, the jumping genes and I get McClintock, Barbara McClintock, I mean, whoever in the past has given us our insights about what we understand about the world. These are human beings, including Darwin himself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Tracy, I didn't mean to jump in on you there. Did, was there anything you wanted to add before we move into our formal project phase of the round table? Sure. Uh, I want to agree with David, and I love the idea of bringing the human, you know, the, the stories into the science, and he, he obviously knows a lot of them. <laughs> But um, I wanted to add to as far as resources go that when I started looking, I mean, I kind of looked through the literature and I sort of, I, I went around in circles for a long time, but there's so much out there that's already made. That's just kind of what I wanted to emphasize is that it doesn't have to be something that's invented. If you go looking for it, there's, there are people making this stuff already that you can bring back and adapt to your own situation. Because I know it'd be great if we could all have the time to, you know, develop all of this. But sometimes it's 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 a lot easier just to take something that's already there, and there is stuff out there if you look for it. Thanks, Tracy. And I may follow up with you to pick your brain a little and see if we can have a bibliography or some kinds of example resources we can share with folks after this roundtable. Because um, I know practical is always great. And speaking of practical, um, we'd love to get into the nuts and bolts of your project. Um, so let's start with you, Tracy. And if you could just share a little bit about the project you developed and how it um, really highlighted these themes of culturally sustaining pedagogy and precision medicine. Sure. Let me share my slides. All right, so my um, master teacher fellowship project is titled, What Can DNA Tell Us About Race? Um, but it actually kind of goes through a little bit more than that. But this is sort of where I started with my ideas. I really wanted to talk about um, race as a social construct and not a biological fact um, and make the point that the racial characteristics that we see that seem so obvious and you know these, these very big differences are actually very small differences and they're very recent in human evolution um, and that they're due to uh, 
acclimation to different climates once humans migrated out of Africa. Um, and then beyond that, you know, these are recent evolutionary developments and that they're superficial. They don't reflect on the deeper, more complex human characteristics like intelligence and ability. Um, and, and to get across the idea that there's as much genetic variation within one racial group as there is between different races. So that the idea that race is not really a biological fact, it's, it's a social construct. Um, while we were having one of our meetings for the fellowship, I had a discussion in a small group about equity. Um, and somebody said something that really sort of revolutionized my thinking about it as far as my own school and what I could do about it. And that was, she said that it, the equity is really about increasing access and opportunity. And I thought, well, I mean, that's something solid I can think about. How can I increase access and opportunity at my school? So we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're in the middle of you know, this biotechnology and pharmaceutical hotspot. There's so many opportunities in science around us. Even in Gilroy, you know, we have biotech companies. Um, and we have all, all kinds of pathways available locally. We have state schools that are local. We have University of California. We have community colleges where you can go and get a one year or a two year certificate and go get a job. And we're even right now, I'm working on getting my high school biotechnology class articulated so that students can get college credit while they're taking my class in high school. So there are all these opportunities, but who knows about this, right? I have all these students that are completely unaware that any of this exists or that it's an option for them. And so I decided rather than creating another piece of curriculum for my biotechnology class, I would focus my project on my biology classes to show, you know, kind of give my freshmen, everybody coming in and a, a little peek at biotechnology and what's op what, what the options are. And so that's where I decided to focus. So my project has four parts, ancestry and genomics, DNA and race, hands-on labs, and careers and pathways. So we sort of get into this topic um, by having a discussion about direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So introducing this as a, have you ever had your DNA sequenced or do you know anybody that's had their DNA sequenced and you know what can you find out? In, uh, this was a really engaging thing for my students because a lot of them have had their DNA sequenced um, or they know somebody that has. So this sparked off really great discussions about, um, you know, what they've found out or what other people have found out through these genetic tests. Um, from there, we learned a little bit about genomics through some lab exchange um, articles and videos. Um, and then we led into DNA and race. So we started out with sort of a reflection on what is race and um, some student re written reflection, some discussion, allowing students a voice and in, in their own thoughts and experiences and definitions. Um, and then we watched a documentary that was made by UC Berkeley in 2003 called The Future of an Illusion, or Race the Future of an Illusion. The first episode, focuses on genomics and the differences between races. Um, and so, you know, we learned through that um, documentary, sort of the history of how people have tried to prove over time that certain races have, you know, different attributes or that they're better at certain things or worse at certain things or more or less human um, and basically realizing that all of that is based on junk science and that none of it's actually true. Um, but race is still, though it's not necessarily a biological fact, it is still um, something that means something to people. And so I wanted to give some space for student reflection to sort of express what race means to them. So um, beyond that, 
one of the things I really wanted to do was to get some biotechnology tools in my students' hands and get them to be able to experience what it's like. Because the first time I did work with DNA in college, it was like an aha moment. It was like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. And that's one of the things I've always um, loved about teaching biotechnology is the opportunity for my high school kids to be able to do this. But I wanted, again, I wanted to increase the equity, increase the access. And so I decided to bring this into my biology class and it's something we haven't done there before. But um, kind of the main point here, right, is to get them using the tools, to get them to experience what it's like. Um, and so there are a lot of different hands-on labs that can be done. There's a really great uh, mitochondrial DNA sequencing and comparison lab that's online that actually is sort of a partner to the film that we watched. Um, and then ABE has the foundations of biotech, which is pipetting and running dyes through a gel. And the exploring precision medicine, although much longer and more intense, would also really fit in well with this um, unit. What I ended up doing with my students this year, uh, we had sort of a some DNA leftover from a crime scene lab that we had done in my biomed class. So my students got to pipette and run gels, and it was really, really fun. Uh, and so after all that sort of winding path, we ended with a section on careers and pathways in biotechnology. So uh, we used some lab exchange uh, scientist profile videos. So students got to choose careers and scientists that they were interested in um, to learn more about them. And then we explored a really great website called biotechcareers.org and that has just a wealth of information about biotech and how to get into it. It's got descriptions of all kinds of careers. It's got pathways. Um, and it also has links to job listings. So I had my students explore all of those things and then sort of reflect on um, the things that they had learned and, uh, you know, also about uh, what might be things that they want in a career or don't want in a career. So that was sort of a winding path through my, my unit, but um, my intended outcomes here, first of all, to introduce genomics, and this was in our genetics unit in biology. I wanted to discuss and reflect on race um, to teach students, you know, that this is not a biological fact, um, but also to give student voice, you know, to express what it, what it means to them. I wanted my students to experience doing biotech, to get it in their hands and to actually do the labs. Um, and then I wanted to increase their awareness of the opportunities that are out there, the careers, the ways to get into those careers and the local jobs. So that was my project. Tracy, thank you so much for sharing that. And for um, those of you who are on our roundtable, you can access Tracy's project on the website. So if you go to Amgen Biotech Experience website, um, you can go to the curriculum resources. And um, Amy, I don't know if you can paste in our password, which is Merlot um, in the chat with some numerals mixed in there. So I'll, I'll just let her paste it so you can have it, but, but you can download the project there. Um, David, I know you were busy working on your project at the same time um, in the same cohort of the fellowship. So can you share a little more about what you focused your project on and, and how that helped you infuse culturally sustaining pedagogy into teaching precision medicine? Sure, so I don't have those pretty slides that Tracy had, uh, but I think that's a good thing because, um, uh, um, if you know me, my students will tell you that uh, you got slides. Now I'm talking for way too long. So this way I can uh, be a little more precise and concise here with, my, with what I have to say. First of all, I, I just want to point out one of the things that Tracy had that I feel is very important. That's the reflective piece. John Dewey said, we don't learn from experiences. We only learn from reflecting on those experiences, right? If you experience something and you don't reflect on it, it's like if you didn't re, you know, experience it at all. So I love that part of, of Tracy's um, project. I think it's really important that we do more reflecting uh, in, in all of our classes. Now, the project that I uh, addressed, um, the, what I did with the project is I addressed several misconceptions, building a lot on what uh, Tracy had brought up, including 
uh, when race became a biological entity, uh, supposedly, according to the scientific world. So really exploring that history from Linnaeus all the way up to modern history and, and looking at these racist individuals who have um, aligned themselves with science and pretended that their research was actually scientifically based, including someone as recent as Charles Murray uh, in 93 when, when Hem and Hernstein uh, published a, a bell curve. And the idea there, of course, uh, was that, you know, Black uh, people have inferior IQ and the message is that we should stop spending money, on, right? So this was, uh, this, it's just really sad because it, it literally goes against the very grain of what we do as educators, which we believe our students are capable learners, people that can change the world. And uh, it was first Jenner in 69, who in the Harvard Ed Review wrote, uh, did a government should stop spending money on educating black people because they're just not gonna be smart. And then again, that was reinforced in 93 with uh, Murray and Herstein and the, the bell curve. Now you would think that that's done. We now understand that genetics are, um, sort of indicative of our similarities and that any differences that we see between outcomes of people are much strongly related to the cultural component and the way that people are being raised and the opportunities that they're afforded as opposed to genetic differences. And so to me, it's 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 sort of upsetting to, to believe and to understand that there's still people who, who think uh, that this is the case. Um, and, and sadly enough, sure enough in 2009, the Harvard dissertation by Jason Richwine, uh, where he states that um, Hispanics have a lower IQ than quote unquote native whites, and that uh, Hispanics are damaging the uh, collective IQ in the United States because of our ignorance or whatever it is that we bring. And uh, I don't know that cabron, but I'm telling you, I'm glad that I, I've never seen him because uh, first of all, who the heck is a native white? And second of all, he brings up a really significant problem here scientifically, which is he's saying that all Hispanics are a race. I happen to be lightly pigmented. I have family members that are more darkly pigmented. And it, it, one of the things that happens is we start to really see how these quote unquote scientists really confound uh, what, what uh, race really is. And I just wanna bring up very quickly an, an example of something that happened. And uh, it's something that I share with you in the past, Jess, there was a curriculum that uh, my district uh, went ahead and bought. It's a very well-known curriculum. But in this curriculum, they use um, the terms Caucasian and, and there was a bunch of case studies about cancer. So they said, you know, uh, this young lady uh, is a, born to Caucasian parents. And uh, then the next one, uh, he was born to Korean parents. And then the next one was he was born to Mexican parents. And the next one was born to African-American parents. Now, on the surface, that looks innocuous. Okay, so they describe this. When I called them out on it, they actually told me that it had to do with being inclusive. And I thought, okay, first of all, I really find it hard to believe that all the white people in your case studies were all Caucasians, because Caucasians is really a term used for people that were born around the mountains of Caucasus. So therefore, it includes people from Northern India. So that's the first thing I called them out on. I said, I don't, unless these are all people from that part of Europe, like, right in between the mountains of Caucasus of India and Europe. I don't think that you mean Caucasian, so you should use an appropriate term. The second thing is the confounding of race and ethnicity. So I'm Latino, I speak Spanish, I was born, you know, eating empanadas and chicharron or whatever, but that does not increase or decrease the likelihood that I'm going to develop a specific type of cancer. So if in this project, in this curriculum, if what they were trying to imply was that certain groups of people are more likely and more susceptible to develop certain types of cancer, then they should come out and say that. So if they had said to me, look, there's a group of, uh, you know, this young lady who happens to be a uh, descendant of Ashkenazi Jews. Okay, now I understand. These particular group of people have a higher propensity to have a mutation in BRCA1 and BRCA2, and therefore an increased chance of developing both breast cancer and ovarian cancer. That would make sense, but that's not what these people did. So what seems innocuous, you know, what seems uh, innocuous, I'm sorry, what seems to be, you know, non-dangerous by sort of labeling people using these four terms, which by the way, are exactly aligned with Linnaeus' terms of uh, homo sapien europeos, homo sapien uh, africanos, homo sapien asiaticos, and homo sapien americanos. And when Linnaeus uh, sort of declares these four groups, not only does he say that they're sort of different, the, the real sadness here is he goes and describes him when Linnaeus never left Europe. 
He never traveled to Asia. He never traveled to America. He never traveled to Africa. And yet he says things like the African is lazy and dirty and smelly and the, uh, the, the Native Americans are uh, thieves and all, all these sort of qualities that he gives to these people where he never even met them. And so that's where the bad science comes. And I think you're right. I think that language is really important. So I went back to these people and I said, what we're doing is we are inadvertently reinforcing the idea that humans can be grouped into these four categories. And that these categories not only have biological consequences, but also the next step is to think that sociological or social cultural consequences follow. So I can very quickly turn to a group of people and neglect to account for the fact that some people were enslaved exclusively because of their race color, or that people were, uh, that they went to lands and appropriated themselves to lands. And um, sort of the oppression that has taken place of specific people, it's easy to dismiss them if we have quote unquote science that backs us up and says, sure, well, Europeans are just more superior, which is the point that I was trying to make. And so to me, it's, it's really important that my students understand what science is and that at the heart of science is always falsifiability. And so when we look at theories, we need to be able to, to look at what evidence we have to support it. So when, and I'll finish with this, when, when Murray, uh, the proponent of this idea that black people just have lower IQs, there was someone who debated him publicly and it was just a beautiful thing. You know, when he brought his, you know, just chopped them up, his machete and chopped them up and that was Puisant. And what Puisant said to him was, look, sure enough, uh, it, the, the test that you're using that compares white people and black people, it looks like white people have a higher IQ. First of all, I don't believe that your test is accurate, but even if we went over that, the problem is you're not comparing apple to apples. What you need to do is you need to find me a group of white people that were enslaved for 250 years and then oppressed systematically, including by laws for another hundred years. And then you give those, the black people and the white people that were subjected to the same type of history, you give them an IQ test. And it then, the IQ test is different. Now you have some evidence that you can talk about significant ge you know, genetic difference. Otherwise, this is nothing to do with genetics. This has to do with the experience of certain people, the way that they, they were raised, the opportunities that were afforded to them. And so I, I just want to end it with that idea that socially constructed ideas of race lead to real biological oppression of people. And the fact is we have all those measures and we can see them. We can see them by health outcomes. We can see the fact that... Um, you know, age, uh, the expectancy of age is different between, you know, races, the cancer rates, and all of these sort of uh, the social outcomes of health, they're real. And so my students, I, I want them to become aware of that. You know, David and Tracy, I, I have to say that some of the things that you're describing here are really highlighting the fact that, you know, um, that teaching science is not a neutral act. And so this whole idea about how do I as a science teacher begin to unpack this concept and this topic with my students can feel very fraught and it can feel very dangerous and it can feel very risky. Um, and you know, so much of what you say, um, David, just now could be so challenging for a teacher to try to navigate, facilitate those conversations with their students and maybe haven't even had sort of the time to reflect on their own perspectives in those situations. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, I'm, I'm telling a little short story, which is that when we were doing the pilot for precision medicine, I remember in San Francisco, we had a conversation with the, the pilot teachers um, where it kind of started off saying, I, I would have no problem teaching this content because it's, you know, it's pretty neutral content. It's lab, it's, it's a precision medicine lab. And so we're going to go through these steps and that will be that. And then the more we kind of had conversations about the applications for precision medicine and the questions you're asking through precision medicine, then the group kind of said, wow, you know, I'm really thinking now about what kind of preparation I need as a teacher to actually even dive into this topic. And so I wonder if I could ask you, um, and I'm asking you, Tracy, because I remember you were part of that conversation where you said, I'm really having an aha here about this. How did you go about sort of preparing yourself and how might you prepare students to have some of the conversations you're talking about, some of the reflections you built into your project? Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. I do, I, I do remember that aspect of the precision medicine um, pilot and looking back more recently at it, you know, I've kind of delved into some of these things in my classes since and built up some, some comfort with it. Um, I think that 
my experience in the classroom is that students, at least my students, most of them have not reflected on these topics in a very deep way, which was surprising to me, I think, because I, I sort of expected, I know that a lot of my students have been uh, subjected to racism and they've been, um, you know, ha had experiences um, because of their ethnic backgrounds that have influenced them. But I, I don't know if they're, it's their age or, Anyway, I think it's important to sort of uh, lay some ground rules and maybe even um, develop some ground rules together as a class and um, to uh, show respect and to be, because these are potentially contentious topics, um, you know, lay some some ground rules to uh, maintain a level of respect for other people's opinions and for, you know, not attacking uh, people, but ideas. Um, but I have to say my experience of it in my classroom has been a lot less intense than I expected. I thought it was going to be a, a lot more challenging than it actually has been. Thanks so much. I appreciate you letting me kind of put you on the spot like that with that specific situation. And I don't know, David, do you have advice or sort of last words that you would leave teachers with if they're considering um, kind of venturing into these waters and teaching content in this way? Sure, I think one of them is the idea of trying to find blame. And um, I think the best way I, I've heard or read about this is a book by Saini. Um, actually, no, it wasn't Saini, I'm sorry. It was a book cast by Isabella Wilkerson. And in it, she writes, we are not responsible, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact quote, but we're not responsible um, for what people that look like us either did or didn't do hundreds of years ago. Um, and she has this image of you buy a house and you notice that the main beams are crooked. It's not your fault that they're crooked, but now that this is your house, you got to fix it. So it's, this is not about looking for blame. This is about looking at the systems and, and how we can improve them. And so there's nothing more powerful than science because in science, we don't care who said it, how loudly they said it, or how many times you repeat it. Science is about evidence. And when we look at the evidence, when we really start exploring, we realize that these injustices in society were not based. Darwin himself at one point writes, if the misery of the poor be caused not by nature, but by our laws, then great is our sin. And he was right. Well, I can't think of a better way to end our roundtable today. And thank you, as always, um, Tracy and David, for your eloquence and your honesty and for sharing your work with us today. Um, I just appreciate you for, for kind of showing us what it feels like to venture into this territory, into this content. I think you've given some really wonderful strategies and um, some great resources as well. We've had some things flying into the chat. We're gonna to try to pull all of these things out and into the transcript so that those of you who, um, who signed up and who registered for this, you'll get the transcript. Um, we will post the recording on the website. And so hopefully you'll have access to all of those materials. And we did also share the link to both Tracy and David's projects on our website, along with the password, the very secret password, um, so that you can access those materials. So again, I just wanna say a huge final thank you to Tracy and David for being with us today and um, just making the time to share your experiences and your insights. Um, and for all of our participants today, we know how hard it is to make time for this kind of round table. And so we really appreciate you and your spirit of learning and inquiry that you always bring to the table. Um, we are so appreciative of you all as part of our ABE community. So on that note, have a great rest of your day. Uh, we thank you for your time and we'll see you soon, hopefully at the next round table. Take care, everyone.